Sean Puffy Combs is the guy behind the scenes. I had nothing to do with a shooting. He's the soundtrack to Generation X. I've heard horror stories how he can come in and be the complete devil. Sean Puffy Combs is a star. He's a celebrity. Puffy can have an anger problem. There's immediate physical violence that takes place. I just thought I was dead, because I just couldn't move. I do not own a gun, I do not carry a gun. stands atop the music world, a recording artist and producer who lords over a multi-million dollar industry, a rapper who's crossed over to publishing, fashion, and film, a man who's moved from making music in American ghettos to entertaining the wealthiest celebrities of high society, with one of the world's most coveted women on his arm. But the brilliant career of Sean Puffy Combs has been shadowed, shadowed by outbursts of violence, rushes with the law, and a trail of dead bodies. Bodies of friends, bodies of enemies, and bodies of fans. The fact that he has been arrested and had so many brushes with the law in the beginning legitimized Puffy because in the beginning there was always the question as to how, quote, hard he was. But it's beginning to go the other way now. Now, even some of the hardest rappers are looking at him and saying, hey, man, listen, you've got an empire here, you've got money, uh, you've got a name. Is, is this a self-destruct thing? I mean, what are you trying to do? Maybe you just have bad luck, you know? <laughs> you know, I don't think it's too much more than that. I don't think he's purposely going out there trying to hurt somebody. It's like, if you have as much money as he does, there's no need to, for you to hurt anybody. Mr. Cones has a past that keeps reoccurring that is not very positive. And maybe, just maybe, he should stop saying, I just was also at the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, but he created the wrong place at the wrong time himself. Sean Puffy Combs wields considerable power in a cutthroat business. Those around him refuse to be interviewed. Others have been warned not to speak his name on camera. But Sean Puffy Combs cannot stop the wheels of justice. After a highly publicized shooting incident in a New York City nightclub in December 1999, he faces charges of gun possession and bribery. And now, standing trial, he could face a long term in prison. Gun possession of a weapon in the second degree is a Class C felony, which is punishable by up to 15 years in state prison. Criminal possession of a weapon in the third degree is a class D felony, which is punishable by up to seven years in state prison. I do not own a gun. I do not carry a gun. The charges and allegations against me are 100% false. Mr. Combs intends to plead not guilty to the charges filed against him now. We are confident that once all of these facts are carefully reviewed, he will be completely exonerated. It's interesting that, that Puffy denies owning a gun or being around guns because he has a history of being around them. Journalist Stephen Ivory has covered the urban music scene for the past 25 years. On television, in books, and in magazines from Billboard to Vibe, he's interviewed Sean Combs and knows well the two sides of his public persona. Sean Puffy Combs is the guy behind the scenes. He's the man who makes the records. He's the mastermind of the bad boy entertainment enterprise. Puff Daddy, on the other hand, is the figure who performs. He's the person who records and raps and dances and who performs on the records. This album is like an autobiography. 
you know, just about my life over the last couple of years, the good, the bad, the ugly, the happy, the sad, the spiritual, the angry. Puff Daddy's influence and success have been undeniable. In 1997 alone, his Bad Boy Entertainment Company grossed $130 million, with number one rap singles for 33 weeks in a row. At the dawn of 2001, Ebony Magazine estimated his worth at more than $400 million. Puff, his music is kind of like in the same vein as Berry Gordy and Motown. He's, he's the soundtrack to Generation X, especially for black Generation X. He's an icon, a hip hop icon. He's the best, he's the bomb. He's the best rapper they ever had. She shook my hand. I love him. I don't know. <laughs> Every time I see him, I cry. I love Puff Daddy music. He's the man. He's the It's an incredible crowd. You know, I, I got jealous when Ricky Martin came into my town. So I was like, when my album drop, I better see some helicopters up there. This album's just not about Puff Daddy. It's a movie on wax, and it's a lot of co-stars that make up the ensemble. You have um, songs with me and Biggie and Little Kim that have never been released. Um, me and Jay-Z, me and R. Kelly, Busta Rhymes, Nas, Red Man. It's definitely action-packed, star-studded, shine, G-Dep. So it's, it's, it's definitely tight. Well, Puffy's considered a revolutionary in the sense of, uh, I would say, more the business side of anything. His marketing savvy is, is, is incredible. Carlito Rodriguez is editor of The Source magazine, the bible of hip-hop music. He found the way to take what was once considered a hardcore sound and give it a, I don't want to say a softer edge, but let's call it a softer edge. He made it more palatable to a mainstream audience. I think that we knew of Sean Puffy Combs as a hip hop artist and mogul um, before he ever had any problems with the police. Richard Johnson is the man behind page six, the influential gossip column in the New York Post. He followed Sean Combs' incredible transition from an often violent music scene to the social pages. Sean Puffy Combs is a star, he's a celebrity. I know that when Donald Trump had Sean Puffy Combs at the US Open, he has a box there. And you know, there was more people were more excited about seeing Puffy in uh, Donald's box than in seeing any of the other celebrities he had there. But all along, the glorious rise of Sean Combs has been dogged by controversy. Just the contradictions of a human being just laid out there just for you to see live and uncensored. Just, you know, this is what I, this is what I am. This is how I feel. I've heard horror stories how he can come in and boss you around and be the complete devil. But then I've also heard stories where, you know, you can't get a nicer guy than that. One of his old girlfriends uh, has said that uh, Puffy can have an, uh, uh, an anger management problem, that he can you know, be sweet and kind, and in the next second, lose it. And nothing had the impact of what took place on December 27, 1999. Celebrity, wealth, music, and street life exploded in the flash of gunfire. And suddenly, Sean Combs' career and freedom were on the line. The fact that Mr. Combs has been arrested is because some person alleges that he had a gun. It all happened very quickly. In a nightclub, across the street from the New York Times, around the corner from Times Square, only days before the millennial New Year's celebration, Sean Combs brought his girlfriend, Jennifer Lopez, and his entourage to the Club New York. The very presence of Puff Daddy led to confrontation. Someone threw money at the big star. At least one other person pulled a gun. Shots were fired, and three innocent bystanders were struck by the bullets. Julius Jones was shot through the shoulder. I felt it hit me. I just knew I had got shot. I found myself on the floor, laying down, thinking I'm going to die. Natanya Rubin was shot in the face. I'm not famous. I don't have a publicity machine. I don't have a billion dollars of insurance on my body, or any part of my body for that matter. Does that make me any less valuable? After the shooting, Sean Puffy Combs grabbed his girl and ran away. With his driver at the wheel, he careened wildly through red lights for 11 city blocks. 
And when police caught up with him, they found two guns. His teenage protege, the budding rap star Shine, would be charged with attempted murder. And Sean Combs was in his most serious trouble yet. I want to make this 100% clear. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. Jennifer knew nothing, I had nothing really to do with any shooting. She certainly had nothing to do with any gun. Unfortunately, this case has developed a life of its own. This resulted in the filing of charges that we feel are without merit. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. And I feel terrible that people were hurt that night. Sean Combs may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then again, it wasn't the first time. When we come back, the tragic path of Puff Daddy's long lost father. Not a lot is known about him, other than the fact that he was murdered one night in uh, Central Park. And the tragic event that first thrust the name Sean Combs into the headlines. Nine people died and 29 people were injured. You know, one of the very real aspects of Puffy's persona seems to be an impatience. And I believe this is why he has been able to succeed at so many different things. The life of Sean Puffy Combs seems to have been blessed, yet shadowed by crime and tragedy from the very start. He was born in Harlem in 1969, but he wasn't raised in the ghetto. His mother brought him up in one of the most genteel areas, an oasis called the Esplanade Gardens. His father, though, saw another side of life. Sean's father, Melvin Combs, was a, uh, a person who didn't spend a lot of time in Sean's life. This was a guy who had little jobs here and there, but basically he was a hustler. He was a man of the streets. Sean Combs was two years old when his father was taken from his life forever. Not a lot is known about how he was killed, but it's believed that there was some sort of deal going on, some sort of drug deal, if you will. As reported in the New York Post on January 26, 1972, the body of Melvin Combs was found behind the wheel of a brand new luxury car on the edge of Central Park. By most accounts, the newspaper's description of Melvin Combs as a major drug dealer was exaggerated. His death, on a corner that would be named for a musical innovator, opened a new world for his son. After that is when Janice Combs, Sean's mother, moved him into the suburbs into uh, Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is only a short ride up the parkway from Harlem through the Bronx, but it's worlds away from the harsh reality of the streets. Sean Combs grew up in this house, in this leafy, comfortable community. His mother did everything that she could to make sure that he lived, you know, a semblance of a middle-class uh, upbringing. It was basically a middle-class life. Puffy, in his, his early teens, was a uh, altar boy in, in Catholic Church, so he was hardly the street gangster. Sean Combs attended an all-boys high school, Mount St. Michael's Academy. Well, Sean knew the difference between right and wrong. One of his close friends was Terrence Hughes, now a physician at the local hospital. Sean was a quiet, kind of unassuming guy. And I always consider him as a bright kid. And he had, a, he had a very quick sense of humor, but Sean never displayed any sense of temper that I could remember. I mean, other than, you know, being aggressive on the football field, he wasn't, wasn't an aggressive type of kid. It's not clear how he got the nickname Puffy. Some say it was because he'd puff out his chest to appear bigger on the football field. I used to drive Sean home after practice. I, I can actually count myself as his first chauffeur. After graduation, Sean attended Howard University, the prestigious black college in Washington, D.C. Sean got into the music business basically while he was at Howard University. Uh, he was always promoting some type of party or something like that, and that was pretty much the beginning of his ability to promote and market himself and whatever he was trying to get over with. In 1990, Sean Combs left school after two years and soon earned a reputation up and down the East Coast as a top party promoter. Uh, rap was coming along and he was right on the crux of it. Brooklyn DJ Goldfinger worked many events with Sean Combs. He recalls his influence. Basically, it was a very resurgent black college type of feeling that was going on in like the early, like the late 
89, 88, 89, 90. And he had that because he went to Howard or whatever. And he brought that energy with the rest of the people that he knew from that whole circuit into the party, you know, to the party mode. So it was like a real positive, real youthful energy that he brought. He was a dancer as well. He liked to dance, loved the rhythm, loved the ladies, you know, loved the, loved the whole scene. He made the spot. It was like, it was just a happy place to be at. It seems Sean Combs never stopped moving. A year after he quit college, he took an internship at a thriving R&B record company called Uptown. And he befriended one of its artists a rapper named Heavy D. Well, the first time that uh, the name Sean Puffy Combs uh, appeared in headlines was uh, in 1991, when he and rapper Heavy D got together and decided, hey, listen, we're gonna do Shaft's big score. We'll put together a charity event, Celebrity Basketball. We'll do it at City College. The Celebrity Basketball game would thrust the name of Sean Combs into international headlines, but not in a way anyone could have expected. What they did, basically, was sell tickets, opened up the doors, and just let everybody in. Combs had about 22 security people uh, overseeing the event, and their role was to make sure that it was an orderly and, and safe event. The event in the basement gymnasium attracted thousands more fans than expected. While Sean Combs was inside the gym, the fans lined up here at the only entrance. At a crucial moment during the melee, he and his group decided to close the door to the gymnasium, which effectively created a damning effect of the people that were trying to enter the gymnasium. Those at the top of the stairs had no way of knowing what was going on at the bottom. It was chaotic, there was a lot of people, people screaming, moaning. It's just a, a scene you can't describe. Ultimately, nine people were killed and 29 were injured. The people who were killed basically suffocated to death and were crushed to death when they all gathered in a stairwell that went absolutely nowhere. And uh, these people had no place to go. And everybody wanted to see the game and people just got crushed. Most of them died from asphyxiation, and many of them were injured and close to asphyxiation. I just think that it was a freak accident. You know, it happens at, at rock concerts. It happened at the Who concert in, what, Cincinnati in 1975 or whatever the case may be. And, you know, they didn't single any one person out for that to happen. They just changed the way they did it. No, it wasn't a quick death. It took a very long time, unfortunately. According to the doctors that we've spoken to, uh, it probably took between 10 and 15 minutes them to actually uh, perish. Peter DeFilippis was a plaintiff's attorney when Sean Combs, his partner Heavy D, and the City College of New York were sued by the victim's families and injured survivors. He was there in 1999 when Judge Louis Benza ruled on who was responsible. Judge Benza made a decision that uh, Cooney College was 50% liable for the uh, tragedy and Sean Combs and Heavy D. Dwight Myers were also 50% liable for the deaths and the injuries. The judge issued an opinion on what led to the tragic loss of nine lives. According to Judge Benza, the fateful decision was to keep the doors closed and not to open them. Had the doors been open, it would have released the pressure of the crowd and the crowd would have uh, sifted into the gymnasium where they would have been safe. I was a promoter of the event, you know, and I, I'm sorry for being a promoter of the event and anything that I could have had to do with this tragedy. The judge's report also included a shocking reference to Sean Combs' activities at the time the fans were dying. He cited testimony from a police officer who worked his way over the crowd, through the doors, into the gym. Police officer Harris testified that uh, Sean Combs and two other women were at the bottom of the stairwell on the other side of the doors, pushing a table up against the doorway and holding money in their hands. The lawsuits moved along for nine years. We watched Sean Puffy Combs grow into a major star. He had a, a major ascendancy during the uh, nine years that it took to actually get him to settle this case. I just wish that everyone would just admit their mistakes, live up to their responsibilities, and that's basically it, so we can move on. It's a tragic event, and 
you know, my heart just goes out to the family. In the end, Sean Combs paid those families and some of the injured more than half a million dollars. I deal with every day of my life, but the things I deal with can no way measure up to the pain that the families deal with. And I just pray for the families and I pray for the children that lost their lives. But though the incident cast a shadow over the career of Puff Daddy, it had another unintended effect. The City College thing definitely brought him to the spotlight. People started looking at him, whether or not they made judgment calls or not, as, well, who is this kid, you know? How is this kid responsible for this tragedy? Whether or not they were, you know, hating him or just wondering. When we come back, the rise of Sean Puffy Combs changes the music world, but continues to be shadowed by violence and death. After Biggie Smalls was murdered, Puffy went into seclusion. He thought, literally, that uh, he was going to be next. How would I describe Puff Downey? The first impression that comes to mind is um, ambitious. I think he's, um, you know, he knows what he wants and he, and he goes after it. Sean Combs rebounded from the nine dead bodies at City College. Nothing would stop his rise at Uptown Records. Nothing but his own ambition. When he went there, he was just an intern. He was just the guy that, uh, you know, people sent out to get tapes or to uh, take this down the hall. People who work there remember him to be very anxious and willing to do whatever he could to, to have some type of a hands-on knowledge of the business. He wanted to learn. He was an intern, but it was kind of like he was running a company to a certain degree because he brought in all the hot acts that everybody was following. I remember the first time I ever heard of Sean Puffy Combs, he was the number two at a record company, and people were talking about how brilliant he was. He began to get a little too big for his britches at Uptown as a producer, as a person who had input into the artist's careers. So he had to go. <laughs> he had to go. In 1993, Sean Combs went solo. In no time, he had his own label, Bad Boy, and his own star artist, a gargantuan rapper named Christopher Wallace, also known as Biggie Smalls, soon to be known as Notorious B.I.G. Notorious B.I.G. was, in my opinion, the greatest rapper to ever, ever do it. Everybody knew about this kid from Brooklyn, this young, big guy from Brooklyn with uh, incredible verbal dexterity, let's call it that way. I mean, this guy's rhymes would paint pictures. It was like, it was like watching a movie, hearing this guy rap. Christopher Wallace, AKA Biggie Smalls, was basically a, uh, a street cat. They didn't call him Biggie Smalls for nothing. I mean, he was, a, he was an imposing figure, but uh, to the people he knew, he was just a lovable guy. The teaming of the big man from Brooklyn and the hot suburban producer changed the face of rap. When Sean Puffy Combs met Biggie Smalls, something happened. He'd found his soulmate, and uh, Biggie had found his as well. Oh, it was a phenomenon. It was a perfect marriage, like Batman and Robin. Their first big hit together was uh, Ready to Die. The title would be prophetic because Sean Combs was now at the forefront of hardcore gangster rap head-to-head -head against a fearsome West Coast mogul named Suge Knight and his label, Death Row. They happened to be with two different record companies. One was on one coast, one was the other. They started bad-mouthing each other on records. The fans picked up on it tremendously, and it evolved into the East Coast-West Coast rap war. Sean Combs got in the middle of the East-West rivalry because he was one of the top cats on the East Coast. He was out there. He was, a, he was a symbol. He was a target. Sean Combs found himself with one less ally after rapper Tupac Shakur was invited to one of his recording sessions. Tupac, in 94, showed up at the Quad Studios in New York City to make a guest appearance. And when he was there, <laughs> that was when he was uh, walking down the hallway. Two men approached him, shot him five times, took his jewelry, left him there to die, literally. Investigative journalist and author Kathy Scott has done extensive research into the rap wars. 
She says this incident was very bad news for the bad boy organization. Tupac thought that, that they had something to do with it, that they had him set up, that that's why he went to the studio. And in all the research I've done and all the people I've spoken to, I haven't found anything that substantiates it. Puffy somehow was blamed for this by Tupac, and he never forgave him. Suge Knight of Death Row soon took Tupac Shakur under his wing. The two men insulted and threatened Bad Boy every chance they got until September 7, 1996, when Tupac was murdered. Tupac was in Las Vegas to uh, see a prize fight. And later on that evening, uh, Tupac was a passenger in the car that was being driven by Suge Knight. And uh, another car came up alongside him, and uh, shots were fired. And when the smoke cleared, uh, Tupac was in critical condition, and he died a few days later. The immediate uh, thought after Tupac was killed was that this was an East Coast kind of a hit. Six months later, Biggie Smalls and Sean Combs ventured into enemy territory, Los Angeles, to attend an award show. After the 1997 Soul Train Music Awards, uh, there was an after party for the show at the Peterson Automotive Museum on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. And uh, after that party, Biggie and a couple of his other people got in the car, was sitting outside in front of the place, and uh, that's where he was shot. I believe that if Biggie Smalls were killed because of the East Coast, West Coast so-called rap war, it would have been in retaliation for Tupac Shakur's. The impact of Biggie's death on hip hop was uh, immense, to say the least. For a hip hop person, just for a person anyway, it's, it's kind of like how people feel like when Elvis died, it was like, the hip-hop Elvis, it, it hurt that bad, you know, it really, really, really hurt. After Biggie Smalls was murdered, Puffy went into seclusion. Needless to say, he was devastated, but he was also extremely, extremely frightened. He thought, literally, that uh, he was going to be next. He, he, didn't, he didn't doubt that uh, someone would try to kill him. Everybody's heart went out to him because they knew it's like Batman and Robin, it's just like, you know, you know, if Robin's not there or Batman's not there, it's not the same. Sean Combs fired back, not with a gun, but with a tribute. Puffy went to Sting and said, hey, listen, I want to use that song that you uh, had out some years back called Every Breath You Take. And I'd like to make it a tribute to Biggie. And he called it, uh, I'll Be Missing You. And it was, ironically, the biggest thing that, uh, Puffy is done. Meanwhile, Suge Knight had been sent to prison for a parole violation. Death Row crumbled. In 1997, Sean Puffy Combs stood alone as the king of hip hop music. When Mugshots returns, the legacy that began with his father's murder haunts Sean Combs again and again. So he got very angry and he went to Steve Stout's office and Steve Stout got him beaten and uh, Sean Puffy Combs w got arrested. Great Gatsby comes to mind when you, when you think of Puffy. Here's a guy who uh, is living high on the hog, doing everything larger than life, but has a propensity for something tragic happening. And he seems to be the 21st century version of that. I think... Uh, Gatsby is the, is the proper analogy. I think that people uh, wonder who he is, but they're fascinated. And I'm proud as a black designer to, um, to have the windows at Bloomingdale's for one of the first time in history. So thank you very much. One thing that I like about Sean John Coles is the material. Um, it's classy. I mean, I could change up, very versatile. As you notice, I'm 320 pounds. It comes for full figure men, it's comfortable. Move, move, don't look cheap. By 1999, Sean Combs had moved far beyond music with two restaurants, a magazine, and a fashion line that grossed $70 million in its first season. The sky's the limit. You know, if you believe you could do it, you could do it. 
you know. So as long as you keep the quality. When Puppy comes along, you know, the general consensus is, oh, here we go again, another another person trying to, you know, come up with clothing styles and glorify T-shirts. But he hired some good designers, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and hands down, you know, a lot of people like Sean John clothing. Puffy's actually gotten good reviews from the people who cover fashion. And the man who rolled with gangster rappers became a surprise celebrity on the New York City social scene. No little thanks to a high-profile girlfriend, actress Jennifer Lopez. For me, it's all one big game. <laughs> one big party. No, it's a lot of hard work, but I love what I do. Meeting Jennifer somehow validated him. Uh, it pushed him over into the apex of name brand. I think the romance with Jennifer Lopez put it on a whole new level. The sum is greater than the whole of the part. Well, for guys like me, it just made me feel like, well, there goes my chances with Jennifer. <laughs> Sean Combs also had unlikely new friends, billionaires like Donald Trump, Ron Perlman, and Martha Stewart. Page Six editor Richard Johnson understands. I think there's a lot of people out there like a Donald Trump, like Martha Stewart, who don't want to be left behind. And when they see something come along, a new phenomenon, they want to understand what it is. And I think that's part of the fascination with Puffy. Hip hop is popular culture. To remain hip, you know, you have to be with the hip. Sean Combs became known for throwing lavish parties in the city and at his new $2.5 million mansion in the Hamptons. Publicist and Hamptons columnist Nora Lawler was a guest at many. I first met Sean Combs in St. Bart's when he threw a big party on his yacht. I think he's fun, and I think his parties were great. And he mixed a society, celebrities, moguls, models. Sean Puffy Combs was the pioneer. He was the first uh, hip-hop guy to get a house out in Hamptons. I was invited to one of his parties at his house. He had the white party with a great A-list crowd. I was at his white party last summer, and if you weren't wearing white, you couldn't get in. Ron Perlman had to go buy an outfit, and Martha Stewart, he wouldn't let anyone in unless they had a white outfit on, and it made it intriguing. Some people didn't come in white, and he forced them to take their clothes off, and, and they were wearing towels. Girls were coming in with big bath towels wrapped around them. So it's, uh, it's a good, it, it works. Yet for all his newfound success, Sean Combs was followed by legal troubles and disturbing incidents. In 1995, he allegedly threatened a university worker with a gun. He was fined for criminal mischief after allegedly pulling a gun on a newspaper photographer that same year, 1998, an alleged assault on a nightclub bouncer. The bouncer decided not to press charges. And then, on April 15, 1999, an incident that even surprised his critics. Puffy, there's a bad rumor going around that either you or your people were involved with beating up a record executive. Oh, yeah. what, what's your side of the story on that? Um, I heard that rumor too. I don't even really know where it came from. Either. So nothing to do with you? I mean, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Trouble began after Puff Daddy made a guest appearance in a rap music video. Now, in this video, Puffy appears on a crucifix, on a cross, in the same fashion that Jesus Christ appears in the Bible story. After he did it, after it was filmed, he consulted his spiritual advisor, a guy by the name of uh, Hezekiah Walker, a minister. And when Mr. Walker heard this story, he said, oh, no, Puff, man, you... <laughs> You gotta fix that. You you can't you can't do that. This is not right. This is this is blasphemous. Sean Combs asked record executive Steve Stout that his scene be cut from the video. Steven Stout told him, "Hey man, no problem. I'll see that that's done." Well, what happened while all of this was being talked about was the fact that MTV had a copy of this tape delivered to them, and they ran this thing. And, of course, when Puffy found out that millions of people had seen it, he went ballistic. Security cameras captured the incident as Sean Combs entered Steve Stout's office with two very large men. He got very angry and he went to Steve Stout's office and Steve Stout got a beaten. According to the police reports, uh, one of the men watched the door while Puffy and one of his other henchmen beat this guy silly. There was a phone used. There were books used. There was a champagne bottle 
used as well. And uh, they did some damage to this guy. Sean Combs, CEO of a major corporate enterprise, was charged with second degree criminal assault. Did you beat the guy up? What do you think about I'm the sorry, I can't comment Any right charges? The industry's reaction to the Steve Stout incident was uh, a little bit of shock. What's more surprising is what happened hours after the beating of Steve Stout. Sean Puffy Combs hosted a party for his new magazine. There was a tremendous turnout, and the surprising thing was that people like Donald Trump and Martha Stewart and all sorts of uh, you know, Upper East Siders and moguls and billionaires turned out and basically paid tribute to Sean Puffy Combs. As it always happens, somehow, uh, there was a settlement reached outside of court. Stephen Stout supposedly got an out-of-court settlement somewhere up to a million dollars, I'm told, and it went away. For the vicious assault, Sean Combs was sentenced to a one-day anger management class, and he carried on until a few nights before New York City's millennial celebration. Still ahead, the gunshots and the gun charges. I just thought I was dead because I just couldn't move. I left my daughter that night before I came to the party. And when I kissed her, I thought, you know, when I got shot, I was like, wow, what's going through my mind? I was like, wow, was that my last kiss I gave him? Uh, am I going to die? Sunday, December 27th, 1999. A night of celebration at the Club New York in Midtown Manhattan. Julius Jones was a city parks worker who came with his friends to party. Uh, it was a, a hip hop club, New York, Club New York. It's a hip hop club, everybody go there on Sundays. And, you know, it, it's, it's a nice club. The hot chocolate event was known to attract a well heeled crowd of rap fans, music and sports celebrities, and street kids with money. Goldfinger was the club DJ that night. That night, it was a very festive type of night. There was a holiday crowd, so it was a lot of different people there. It was a lot of, you know, a lot of people. Sometime after midnight, word spread that Sean Combs and Jennifer Lopez had arrived. My understanding is that when Sean Puffy Combs showed up at this club, he showed up with a whole entourage. He didn't just show up with Jennifer Lopez. He showed up with a whole group of people. And he throws the term out, posse. They like to now say, put a spin on it, that he had security guards with him. The entourage reportedly numbered up to two dozen people. Among them was Sean Combs' latest discovery, teenage rapper Jamal Barrow, also known as Shine. Shine is a young kid from Brooklyn. He gained attention because people were saying that his, his voice, his vocal tone, had an uncanny resemblance to, to Biggie, to Notorious B.I.G. They came in, they danced. It wasn't too much to it. It wasn't a big commotion. Puff came to the to the booth and, you know, thanked me for playing his records and stuff of that nature. You know, it was, you know, wish me a Merry Christmas and all that good stuff. You know, it was, it was that time of the year. We were having a good time. You know, we in the club, walking around, dancing, having fun. You know, we saw a couple of celebrities in there. You know, Jennifer Lopez, Sean Combs, Puff Daddy. Suddenly, there was a commotion near the bar. Witnesses say some alleged drug dealers began to argue with some of the Puff Daddy group. As Sean Combs worked his way through the crowd, one of the dealers tossed money in his direction. The big man comes into the room, and there's always someone to challenge him. I mean, hey, you know, people challenged Mr. T at, at the height of his, his fame. So when Puffy walks into the room, someone allegedly threw money at him. Now, in the rap game, in hip-hop, in the street life, when someone throws money at you, that is an insult. I mean, uh, something along the lines of, hey, you need this. Sean Puffy Combs has what, what they call street lingo been dis, disrespected. And there's only one way to react to that. You don't ask someone to apologize. There's immediate physical violence that takes place. Shots were fired. I was reaching for another record. And I, I thought it was my, actually, I thought it was my needle skipping. So I went to check my needle, and then I just like looked out, and then everybody was like, you know, like ducking or whatever. Witnesses say the shooter was Jamal Shine Barrow. Three bystanders were hit. I heard the gunshot. If, if I felt it hit me, I didn't know what it was, but I, I, 
I just knew I had got. I just knew I had got shot. I hit the floor suddenly, real quick. He was doing nothing but talking to his friends when uh, guns were drawn, and he ended up with a bullet that went into his shoulder and lodged in his spine. I just thought I was dead because I just couldn't move. It was just like you know, a lot of people running, scrambling to get to get to their coats and getting out of the club, or just finding out where their friends were. Puffy and Jennifer Lopez and. His entourage made a hasty exit. The couple and bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones jumped into an SUV driven by Wardell Fenderson. The car careened up 8th Avenue in a wild getaway. Coons and Jones fled the nightclub in the Lincoln Navigator and were arrested on West 54th Street and 8th Avenue after an 11 block chase by police. Police say a search led to two guns, one tossed from the vehicle, the other on the floor. Both had been stolen. Puffy was arrested along with Jennifer Lopez, and they spent the rest of the day in jail, in court. Jennifer Lopez was later released without charges. Sean Combs was charged with weapons possession. Possession of a loaded gun carry the presumption of intent to use. Later, Sean Combs was charged with bribery. At the precinct, Combs allegedly offered to pay his driver to admit owning the gun. And he offered collateral, a $40,000 ring, a gift from Jennifer Lopez. Meanwhile, Puff Daddy's protege, Shine, had been arrested separately and charged with firing the shots that hit the club patrons. Attorney William Schweitzer represents one of them. We're suing Sean Puffy Combs, his record company, Bad Boy Records, Jamal Shine Barrows, Club New York, and uh, Mr. Burgos, the owner of the club. The suit itself is for $100 million. For once, the magic that Sean Combs possessed seemed to leave him, and the shadow that followed his life and career appeared to have taken over. When we come back, the trial of Puff Daddy. He brought a violent urban soundtrack to suburbia. Now, the shenanigans that gained him credibility in the rap world could end his career. Yet those who know him are not about to count out Sean Puffy Combs. Based on his magical track record of, of, of coming through the fire, relatively unscathed, I think people think he's going to be all right regarding this latest legal trouble. Man to man, I hope he does come out OK. I don't want to see anybody do time. I don't think that uh, his arrests have hurt him at all in terms of uh, his social life. I think he's getting invited to just as many parties, and I think that when he throws parties, you have just as many people trying to get in. I don't think anybody is going to stay home thinking, oh, there might be a shooting. As long as somebody believes that, you know, this kid can really still make things happen and they can believe his magic, he's going to be all right. He's going to keep commanding the same power he commands. But if Sean Puffy Combs makes it through this latest trial, it will be up to him to step out from the shadow. At this point, Puffy is one step away from being that cartoon. He's doing game shows now. He's a household name. Jay Leno does monologues on him. And in rap, when you reach that point, that's pretty much the beginning of the end. Puffy can break that mold, but right now, he's heading down that road. On March 16, 2001, Sean Puffy Combs was acquitted of all charges.